Hey guys and welcome back to Alan Coco Science Show. It is Friday and a bright sunny day. I've got my Freaky Tiki Friday shirt on and I am ready to talk about the coronavirus. I know you probably are like really tired of hearing about it or talking about it or you just have come here to um, de-stress but it relates to science and I want to talk about bats in particular. So today I'm gonna do kind of like a three-part video. Uh, the first one is like what the heck just very basics of coronavirus what is it where does it come from two a mini bat chat where i answer questions for my social media and three what caused the coronavirus so um that's the microphone what are you sniffing for without further ado let's get started so first off what is a what's a coronavirus so We've been dealing with COVID-19, which comes from, there haven't been 18 coronaviruses. There are tons of coronaviruses. It's a whole like class of virus. And one thing they have in common, they're RNA viruses, which is a genetic material that is single-stranded. And they have a kind of a, a lipid envelope that encompasses the RNA, the genetic material. They have these club-like spikes all over it, kind of like a crown. Oh cute and it infects birds and mammals and depending on what animal you are it's gonna affect you differently so humans with a coronavirus might react differently than like a pig or a chicken or or like exotic animals as well and the way a virus works is basically they insert their RNA their genetic material into our cells and then our cells go through um, basically they go through replication where they replicate DNA and split and create more cells and uh, in that process, they're going to replicate the RNA of those viruses, creating more viruses. It's sneaky, I know. Viruses, man, they're spooky. So where did this coronavirus come from? Do you know? Do you know where the virus came from? She does not know, but uh, we aren't 100% sure either. However, genetic research showed that uh, from 10 early patients of coronavirus, their genetic material had a 99.98% match, meaning it made the jump to humans very recently. But they tested the genetic material of the COVID-19 and compared it to the genetics, the genetic sequences of a bunch of coronaviruses. And there was an 88% match with two that come from bats. Now there are so many rumors out there, so much just conflicting information. Uh, some say that it came from eating a bat from a wet market, or also that it went from bats to pangolins to humans. And I, first of all, I love bats. I also love pangolins. <laughs> Hi, and I love cocos too. Either way, I find both the idea that it potentially came from pangolins or bats very disturbing. And here's why. Uh, bats have a lot of um, fear around them in a lot of different cultures. Since the coronavirus happened and since a lot of people believe it's because of bats, a lot of people have been senselessly killing bats. I love bats, they're so beautiful, I love them. Now pangolins are little awkward cuties that uh, they're actually the most heavily trafficked mammal in the world and they're heavily poached. So uh, the fact that if people thought they were, if pangolins had given us the coronavirus, may lead to more of them dying and there's many that are you know on the verge of extinction so i hope people don't assume pangolins started this and start senselessly killing them like they have with bats because pangolins a lot of the species are actually heavily endangered on the verge of extinction like has me worried so i asked on my social media what people wanted me to talk about and so i have four questions or four responses that I found very interesting. First off, uh, Chris and Katie wanted me to talk about bat diversity and bat colonies. So, uh, you may have a very specific image of what a bat looks like in your mind, right? You're probably thinking of something like this. Um, but bats are incredibly diverse. There's micro bats, there's macro bats, uh, there's bats that colonize in caves, trees, the underside of leaves, there's brown bats, white bats, yellowish bats. There are almost 1,250 species of bats. They make up almost a fourth of all mammal species. So uh, they are incredibly diverse and incredibly just so cool. All of them, every single one is cool. 
And I know I did a video on rating every dolphin species. There's no way I can rate every species of bat because they are just, there's so many and they're all cool. How would I even pick who's my favorite? Also, bats have the largest mammal colonies in the world. You'll see thousands of dolphins together or herds of buffalo or antelope. But the Bracken Cave in my hometown of San Antonio is home to 20 million Mexican free-tailed bats. Can you believe that? You got something on you. Now, uh, Vanessa had a great question. She was asking, are bats blind? And will they suck your blood? So first off, bats aren't blind. Many have very great sight, and even though they use echolocation at night to hunt insects, a lot of them will still use their eyeballs. Also, think about it, flowers that are bat pollinated are gonna be like big and white, and you know, that color isn't going to help with ec in echolocation, but they'll be very easy to see for a nocturnal animal. So cool, so cool adaptations. So bats are using their eyes to find these great sources of pollen and nectar. Uh, by the way, they're very important pollinators. So another reason to love bats more. Also, there's so many bats that are not nocturnal. They're awake in the daytime. They forage in the daytime. They eat fruit. So they look for fruit hanging from trees. They're, again, bats are incredibly diverse, not just in how they look, but how they eat and when they eat. Now do bats suck blood? There are a few species that do suck blood, uh, which I think is kind of cool, but <laughs> um, you'll notice that they have faces like pugs, kind of, because that makes it easier for their teeth to get to the skin. Others that eat insects will have kind of like a longer rostrum, but the ones that eat fruit are gonna have a nice long, almost like a fox or a dog or more like Colette, she's over there. Anyway, you'll notice from the shape of like teeth or mouths or jaws or rostrums, you might get a clue on what that animal eats. Uh, there's again over 1200 species of bat and uh, they're all so diverse in how they live, including their diets and it's fascinating. I also got a question from my friend Janae. She wants to know how important is guano? Guano balls. Collect the whole set. Yes, guano is the poop from birds or bats. And you know, you might not think about it, but guano is very nutritious for plants. It has high amounts of um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which are key ingredients to making healthy plants and healthy crops. Animals that fly and animals that evolved from those that flew poop a lot because you gotta like empty out the system. You gotta be as lightweight as possible. So birds and bats poop about every 10 minutes, even flightless birds. Penguins will poop every 10 or 15 minutes. It's a lot of poop. So guano, again, is super nutritious and is very key to a cave ecosystem. There's not a lot of soil or nutrients being cycled in. It all comes from the bats. And actually, did you know bats hang upside down? Or for them, it's for us, it's right side up. They hang by their forelimbs and poop that way. I think that's so wild. So the poop in the cave is very important to keeping the cave ecosystem healthy. It brings in nutrients for bacteria, fungi, food for other animals like a cave fish. Guano is very important for the ecosystem. We've been using it for fertilizer and gunpowder. It's actually still a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, the problem is that when you harvest guano, whether it be from a bird or a bat, uh, colony, you could be damaging the ecosystem or damaging their natural kind of behaviors. While it is a good source, it's all it comes with its uh, downsides. Everything does. Uh, but the good news is that while we still are continuing to use it for fertilizer, it's at a much smaller scale than in the past and now we have scientists kind of working to make sure that the colonies aren't disturbed. Finally, I had a question from Christina about white-nosed bat syndrome or white-nose syndrome. Bats are fighting a disease uh, of their own and basically it's caused by this fungus growing on their snout and wings of the bats. It usually happens when they are hibernating and in their colonies and it's contracted skin to skin. So, you know, you have a bunch of bats huddled together touching each other, it gives this fungus a way to spread. It's from Europe and it now is also in the United States and it has infected over 30 species of bats. 
and it has killed millions. Some populations decreased by the size of 90% and some species have become endangered or gone extinct from this white-nose syndrome. In 2008, the Forest Service basically found that but with the number of bats that had died by then, we had an increase in the amount, in the amount of bugs by 2.4 million pounds, which, uh, you know, you might think it's just like mosquitoes around you, but it also, you know, harms farming communities. So bats are really important in our ecosystem and for our farming, and we're still looking for a cure for the white-nosed syndrome. It's easy to blame bats, pangolins, someone else. It's always easy to blame someone else, like another country or another culture. But at the end of the day, what really caused this pandemic is how we've treated the planet. Now hear me out, this isn't like weird hippie stuff. This is based on science. As we lose biodiversity, we introduce stress into an environment, into the species that live there, and uh, we also just interact with species more. As we live in closer contact, we're interacting more. And as we just plain interact with species more, we just automatically increase our risk of picking up these animal to human pathogens that have always existed. And we've had more of these like zoonotic pathogens. So from animals, we've had these uh, other animal species to human diseases recently. We've had an increase as years go on and we will continue to have more as we treat the planet the way that we do. Now uh, research shows that this increase uh, in zoonotic diseases is actually related to environmental change and human behavior. They've always been around and the possibility of catching them has always been there but we just increase the likelihood and the rate because of how we live on and abuse the planet. It's like this, if we have a bunch of people in the room, we increase the risk of passing any germ from one person to another, sorry. <laughs> Likewise, if a bunch of different species are shoved into a smaller amount of ecosystem with whatever remaining habitat they have left, chances are you'll see an increase in diseases passed from animal to animal to this animal. And the stress as their habitat is destroyed probably doesn't help their immune system that much. Increased stress decreases your immune system response. So what do we do? We've got this growing population, growing need for food and for space, but degrading habitat leads to more of these non-human animal viruses. So we can do small actions like um, using less, eating less meat, eating more local, growing food ourselves at home, uh, buying fewer new material goods, not buying things we don't need. <laughs> but we need to think bigger, honestly. And this is going to be like a coordinated effort between many different countries and their leaders, as well as scientists. And this time we need to actually believe scientists. I'm sorry, climate change is real. We, scientists have known about zoonotic pathogens. We need to, we need to listen to scientists. Hey, did you get that lizard? The more we know about how animals and ecology interact and um, are connected, the better we can prepare for and protect ourselves from uh, future issues and prepare and protect our planet. If you can vote, make sure you're voting for candidates that will protect the environment more, uh, as well as, you know, locally better city planning and using the spaces that we have in a beneficial way. And we also need to make sure that social services for humans are met so that if things don't work out, we have a safety net, a nice big safety net. Um, I, there needs to be a complete change in how we treat the planet and small things help, but we need those bigger changes as well. And even a small vote can make a big difference. I'll leave some cool articles in the description, including a study done by Dr. Kate Jones that you'll want to read and uh, as well as links to all the sources that I may have used in this video, as well as maybe some others. For the question of the day, I wanna know, down in the comments, let me know what changes you would like to see and how we protect our planet, or what changes would you make if you were in charge? Kind of a little fun what if thought experiment. Um, thumbs up this video if you learned something new, and uh, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to follow for more adventures, and uh, take care of each other, take care of yourselves, and take care of the planet. We'll see you next time, so bye.